than the angels. And you have crowned him with your glory and honor. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Father God, we proclaim just how excellent you are. We magnify your name, Lord. We glorify your name. We lift you up, God, because you are worthy of all glory and honor and power. Lord, the angelic host proclaim, hallelujah, salvation and glory, honor and power is the Lord our God. The song says, for the Lord our God is mighty, and the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God, he's wonderful. He's glorious. He's powerful. And we lift you up, Father God. You are worthy. And if the angels can bow down and cry out, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, then surely we, whom you have sent your Son down to die for our sins, surely we can stop for just a little bit out of our busy day and give you some praise just for waking us up this morning, for starting us on our way, for putting us in our right mind, for being far better to ourselves than we could ever be to you, Lord. We just want to say thank you, God. And so, Holy Ghost, please accept our offering of sacrifice on tonight. May your spirit rain down on this place like a mighty rushing flood. May you fall down on your manservant and give him a word from on high, God, that it may come forth as meet in due season for your people. And Lord, we turn this over to you. We praise you and we thank you. In your precious and holy name, we say amen and amen. say amen. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, today um, I had an experience where my family came to support me in something good. My 90-year-old grandfather was there, who this year celebrated 72 years with his bride. Hallelujah. My mama was there. My wife was there. All three of my girls were there. My daughter even got out of school to come and be with me. I'm reminded of how God has kept me. I'm reminded of how God has changed me. And how he's been there for me when I couldn't be there for myself. I'm reminded of being an eight-year-old boy. Friendship Missionary Baptist Church. Running home to my great-great-grandmother's house and asking her, can I join church? She said, baby, call your mama. Call my mama. My mama said, yes, you can join. I ran back down to the church. Found Pastor Travis and I yanked on his coat a little bit and I said pastor I want to join church I want to give my life to Christ he said well baby why didn't you do it when I give the invitation and he I said I had to go ask my mama but let me tell you something then I'm going to sing it was between the ending of Sunday school and the beginning of 11 o'clock service and he shut down everything made everybody shut up and sit down and he opened the doors of the church just for me hallelujah and that's one of the reasons today that I love Jesus because he'll shut down everything hallelujah somebody just for you oh, 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 oh. Falling in 
in love with Jesus, falling in love with Jesus, falling in love with Jesus, was the best thing I've ever, ever done. Oh, I want to say it one more time. Falling in love with Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus. Done. I bet you can sing that second verse with me. In his arms, come on, sing. In his arms, come on, y'all. I feel protected. Anybody protected tonight? In his arms, never disconnected. I wish I had some harmony up here. Come on, come out and sing. Come on, sing. Falling, falling in love. Come on, y'all. With Jesus. Yeah, yes. Falling in love. All right now. With Jesus. Falling in love. With Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus, the best thing you've ever done. Praise the Lord. We appreciate our brother ministering to us. I want to welcome you once again. This is our Innovative Impact Conference. 
and we have expanded for the first time to include a praise and worship preaching service each evening. And we are so thankful that you have chosen to be with us. But our primary purpose for this conference is to pour into the heads of some of our pastors and church leaders, but also to pour into the hearts of some of our pastors and church leaders. And we thought that as these ladies and gentlemen have come aside to be refreshed and to be renewed, that it would be appropriate if we spent some time praying that God would empower them, that God would use them, that God would anoint them, that God would fill them afresh with the power of the Holy Spirit. We have an elder in our church that is our administrative elder for prayer. And we have a couple of our prayer warriors who may actually be in our congregation. And we're going to invite our administrative elder for prayer and if we have any prayer warriors. We're wanting them to come to the front and we want all of the pastors and elders who came for this workshop to come and to come down to the altar and as you press into a circle, we're going to ask our prayer warriors to place hands upon you. And we're going to ask for our administrative elder for prayer to pray that God's anointing would fall upon you. We recognize that it's one thing to be trained and to be equipped. It's one thing to come aside and rest for a while. It's a whole nother thing to be empowered with the Holy Spirit. We believe that when you go back to your congregations, your churches, you may have more insight and you may have visions and you may have dreams. You may have skills and you may be equipped to serve, but we want you to be empowered from on high. So at this time, as we bow and kneel together, we're going to ask Wonder Drake, our elder for prayer, to just pray that the power of the Holy Spirit would fall afresh upon our pastors and our elders. Ask the prayer warriors as much as possible to touch one of the elders or pastors. And for the congregation to be in agreement with us, please, if you want to bow or if you want to at least bow your head, get in a prayer position. Holy Father, we thank you so much for the power that's been promised us. Lord, people trust in money. They trust in intellect. They trust in flowery words. But Lord, we're here because we trust in you. We know that you have a plan for individual congregations and for the church at large, that, Lord, you want us to be the spiritual head and not the tail. We don't want people saying, what is Adventism? We want them nodding, saying, oh, yeah, those are Bible-believing people. But, Lord, as we see Satan putting his people in strategic positions, we want to be in strategic positions. We want to be exactly where you would have us to be so that we can claim souls from an area of darkness into this marvelous light. Lord, you have blessed us despite our weaknesses, despite our faults, and we thank you for that. We ask you, Lord God, to do something mighty. Help us to make spending time with you a priority that before we preach sermons, before we pray, before we take up offering, Lord, before we visit, that we have enough Holy Ghost that we can minister to people. We ask you, Lord God, to help open the Bible for us. Lord, sometimes we read the Bible and it's boring. We're not getting anything out of it. But Lord, we ask you to send Gabriel to shine light. Open up the truth, Lord God, so that we can have it in us and then proclaim it mightily. Lord, Satan is shaking us. He's making the world think that they have to follow him <clears throat> in order to have strong marriages, that they have to have perversion in order to be happy, that they have to follow after money in order to be rich. But, Lord, we know 
that you are the source of everything that's right and good. And Lord, we've got to speak this word mightily. They are making a mockery of your name. I feel like it's the time of Elijah, Lord, where they're saying, follow Baal if you want power. They're saying, follow Baal. He's the source of rain. They're saying, follow Baal. He's the reason that the brooks run and the sun shines. And Lord, we need the Holy Ghost to say, oh, no. Oh, no. Lord God, we need to be able to say that God is the reason that brooks run, and God is the reason that the sun shines, that God can hold the sun in the position so that we can stay in the same position so that we can win wars. Lord God, we've got, we need you. We need much more of the Holy Spirit than we currently have. And so, Lord, help us the way babies cling to their mama. Help us to cling to you that way and say we won't let you go until you bless us. I believe, Lord God, that there's a mighty work to be done. And we can't be weak. We can't be fumbling. We can't say we kind of know the Bible. Lord, we can't say we kind of know God. God might. Oh, no, we got to be like Joshua and say, Son, stand still until we win this war. And, Lord, as you say in Daniel 9, you said it someday Michael will stand up. And, Lord, we want that. We want Jesus to stand up. The world has to know that they're following a farce and that there's a God in heaven. He is the source of everything that's good. I love you so much. You deserve all of our praise, all of our glory. Lord, help us to not focus on our accomplishments. Help us not to focus on the, when people say great sermon, help us to bounce it back to you. The only reason people respond to your word is the Holy Ghost impresses them. It has nothing to do with the words that we speak. And so, Lord God, help give us perspective. Don't let Satan trip us up by focusing on ourselves, being proud of whatever position we hold in this church. Help us to be proud that we turn the soul to you. And Lord, when it's all said and done and Christ comes back to get his group, may we be there and say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. of the congregation. Keep praying for your pastor. Keep praying for your preachers, for your elders, for your leaders, so that we might be filled, stay filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. Once again, we want to thank the convener of our conference, Dr. Jesse Wilson, for all of the work that he has done. We also want to affirm the individuals who have been on his team uh, the technological people, the video individuals, the sound individuals. We praise the Lord for our praise team, for our musicians. We praise the Lord for all of the support staff playing a team effort to make sure that this conference goes on without a hitch. And once again, we want to thank you for your presence here this evening. We are honored to have in our pulpit Dr. James Doggett who is the pastor of the Madison Mission Seventh-day Adventist Church in Madison, Alabama. We are preachers who spend our time feeding others. And anybody who spends time in the kitchen knows that even the cook gets hungry sometimes. It doesn't matter how long you've had to be in this task, whether you've been feeding for a couple of years or whether you've been feeding for 25 years, the cooks get hungry. And sometimes you need to be fed. 
But it's, it's hard to cook for cooks. You know, cooks, cooks can get particular. They're hungry, but they, they're particular. They, they want to make sure that the spices are right. They want to make sure uh, that the balance is right, that the, that the food looks good, and that the presentation is excellent. They want to make sure that it's nutritious and delicious. It's hard to cook for cooks. It's hard to preach for preachers. So that's why we invited a preacher. We know that it's God that prepare, prepares the meal. We know that it's God that gives the word. But sometimes it seems like God just gives an extra word to certain preachers. And we have seen God give a special word to Dr. Doggett in times past. And we are praying that the Lord would give him a word in due season for this moment in time. Begin to even prepare your hearts. Pray now that the Lord would stir up your mind and begin to move your spirit, to break the fallow ground so that the word would land in receptive soil. Let's prepare our hearts to receive the word of God through Pastor James Doggett. After our meditational selection, we will hear the word of the Lord.
the blood that gives me That's powerful right there. You know, Paul worked his way around to his theological position. And that theological position was that I've tried talking about a lot of different things. I've done it eloquently and I've done it well. But it didn't have the impact nor results that I desired. So I've become smart enough to know that I need to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul had one sermon, Jesus Christ and him crucified. When we talk about the blood and when we sing about the blood, we're not talking about somebody who was just cut and let a few drops of blood flow. We talk about shedding blood from a biblical point of view, we're talking about the giving of a life. Everything. What God asks us to do is to be willing to bear our cross. To put it simply, he's asking from us what he's already given. Everything. Really that place that I need to preach to tonight is that secret place where you're reserving something, holding it back from the hand of God. It's the private place, the secret place. 
It's that thing that you will not turn over to the Lord. You won't let him handle it. You may have let him into your life, but there's that room, that closet, that he doesn't have permission to enter and do what he wants there. Stay in the living room, Jesus, but don't come in my bedroom. Stay out of my closet. I don't mind shifting some furniture around, but don't start tearing up things. What God says is when I come in, I take full control. I'm Lord. When I walk into the door, I don't make suggestions. I give orders and commands. I'm in charge. And any place I'm not in charge in your life is going to end up being a mess. In time, just wait. It's going to end up a mess. God must be Lord of all or he won't be Lord at all. That means that there is a secret place. This is a, this is a prophetic moment. You've heard that term? It's a prophetic moment because we're dealing with people who sometimes like to put up facades. It's what we do at church. Yes, it, it's what we do. There are just certain weaknesses we can't expose nor show. And we're so used to hiding it, we don't even let God see it, we think. We'll come into the presence of a holy God who sees in the secret places of our life and will say words we think he wants to hear. When in reality, God wants to take full control, total possession. There's some things in your life he wants to fix. There's some other things he wants to totally demolish. He wants you to experience a crucifixion because at the end of the day, he wants to have a resurrection in your life. But you just won't die, so he can't resurrect you. I'm suggesting preachers, church folks, it's time to get honest and real with God. And let him have all of it. What is it you don't trust in his hands? Your reputation? Do you find yourself fighting to preserve your reputation? What is it that you're holding on to, taking control over? I don't know what it is, but the Spirit of God's telling me right now, yeah, I got a sermon, and I'll preach that sermon, but God's Spirit is telling me right now there's a need to be real in the presence of God. In meetings like this, we like to talk about a lot of good things going on in our lives, but the truth is there's a lot of brokenness that cannot get fixed because we just won't expose it to the healer. If you go to a doctor's office and try to tell him everything's all right, and when he asks you questions, you won't tell him where it hurts, you'll never get well. At some point, there is a need to just be real. There's some fears in this room. There's some insecurities in this room. There's some broken relationships in this room. There are some scars from the past that just won't seem to heal. And the problem is we just won't let the healer put his hands on it. I'm telling you right now, if you let him get his hands on it, if you let him do what he wants to do, you'll be glad when he's finished with it. It gets tiring sometimes playing the game. Keeping a smile on your face when there's a frown going on inside. And talking about how blessed you are when in reality you know you're broken. At some point God will receive the contrite heart. And he'll fix those who are willing to be broken. And open up their brokenness to him. One of the things that I find difficult in these meetings is just being real enough to get well. <sighs> I have a feeling there's going to be a breakthrough in this place tonight. And if somebody gets their breakthrough, don't you even try to analyze it. Just recognize that there must be a healer in the house. And if you just get in line, your turn will come too. I feel it in my spirit. I think I need to, to, to stop and just say a word of thanks to the visionaries of this conference, those who are the originators, Dr. Wilson. Let's get, yeah, it's it, a hand of applause for the wonderful conference that God put into your spirit and you had the faith to act on it along with Dr. Russell and we thank God for what you all have done. This has been another wonderful experience where individuals have come and have gotten their cups full and we thank God for what he's done through you all. Also, I want to say a word of thanks to the visionary of this house, to the angel of this house that is elder Furman Foreman 
Fordham. Elder Fordham. Come on, say amen for Elder Fordham. <laughs> Elder Fordham is also full of the Holy Ghost and chucked full of talent and ability that's been dedicated to the Lord. And I thank God for Elder Foreman. <laughs> Why do I want to call him Elder Foreman? Elder Furman Fordham. God bless you, Elder Fordham. Tonight I want to just give a brief word that comes from the book of Luke. Book of Luke, the 20. Second chapter. Luke 22. Luke 22. Let's bow first before we even go to the word. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to open up the sacred pages of your holy word. We know that this is not a dead letter, it's not ancient literature, but it speaks to our situations today. So what I request from thee as the preacher for this moment is that you will give to me a mind that is focused, a voice that is clear, and a heart that is clean. Use me as a conduit at this time. Bless your people not just with knowledge, but I pray that you would accompany the spoken word with the power of your spirit so that we will leave not just more intelligent, but filled with power. In the name of Jesus, amen. Luke 22, Luke 22, verses 31 and 32. There's something that I am witnessing in a lot of churches that are experiencing spiritual growth and it's a revolution of prayer. What took place tonight down at the altar, I think, is something that moves the heart of God. And in those churches that are growing, I'm seeing that prayer is flowing freely. And when people are free to pray, <laughs> you're talking about unlimited power. There is what some people labor with called the atheism of technique. Others labor with the agnosticism of technique. Atheism is the belief that there is no God, and those who labor with the atheism of technique believe that if they have good enough plans and execute them well enough, that success will come. And then there is the agnosticism of technique, which doesn't necessarily say that God doesn't need to be present and we only need plans, but the agnosticism of technique is when, in fact, I formulate my plans and then I ask God to follow my lead. In other words, God bless what I've already designed. I believe that we're at a point in time where we need to let God lead. That means prayer has to be the first act, not the last act. Prayer is not the way we baptize our human plans, but in fact, prayer is how we are able to discover the plans of God. The Bible says in Psalms 127, except the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it which suggests to me that when we get the plan of God, he is partners with us in building that thing. But we can't expect that God is going to just baptize what we want to do. So I want to talk this evening a little bit about prayer, and the title I want to use is Prayer Changes Things. Luke 22, verses 31 and 32. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon. Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. This particular passage is a pregnant passage that contains all of the pieces that are necessary for a prime time drama. First, there is the main character. He is Simon, also known as Peter. There is the antagonist. We know him by the name Satan or the devil. There is the protagonist, the hero in the story. That's Jesus himself. There is a problem, and that problem is that Simon is both unconverted and he's a tool in the hands of the devil. 
there is a complication because he's not only not converted, but he's been so close to Jesus, he thinks he is converted. And the problem gets worse when you consider he's blind and cannot see his way out. Good news is there is resolution to the problem. I love this passage because it deals, first of all, with a character that we all at some level should be able to relate to. Simon, Simon. Now, it's called Simon twice because God is saying to him through Jesus, Simon, Simon, Peter, come on. The idea is, and no, let's position the passage. Can we do that first? Let's position this passage, and this is just a few hours before the Lord will be crucified. It's one of his deathbed confessions. It would hold a lot of weight in court because it's one of the last things he says before he's crucified. Speaking to a Peter who would later be a powerful preacher, but right now is just an unconverted churchgoer, he says that you got a problem. Look at the life of Peter. It's pretty clear Peter has a problem. We know Peter well, and we like to consider ourselves to be somewhat related to him because Peter would let whatever was going on in his mind reach his mouth quickly. He had no governor, no regulator inside, and he would say what everybody else was thinking. If you look at his life from the time he came to Jesus, Peter is on a roller coaster ride, sometimes up, sometimes down. One moment he's preaching the gospel and casting out demons. The next moment he's cussing and trying to prove he doesn't even know the Lord. This guy, Peter, was unconverted. I know it because Jesus says in the text, Peter, Peter, when thou art converted. I'm not an English major, but I know that suggests that he's not yet converted. He's pointing to a future point in time when he would be converted. When thou art converted, I know that Peter has a problem. Now the problem Peter has is that the devil has claimed possession of him. Hear me now. Satan desires to have you. To possess you. To have control of your life. Now let me stop now and say that you are under the control of one of two powers. You are not your own. All of these decisions you think you're making independently are not being made independently. You are more than influenced. You are controlled. And in this case, Jesus says the devil, no, not the devil, Satan desires to have you. To sift you as we. Now, now, let's break that down. Can we talk about that for a minute? Let, let me explain to you the, 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 the dynamics of what's going on here. Let's really hear what, what Jesus is saying. First of all, he does not say the devil wants to have you. He says Satan desires to have you. Know this, educational moment. The term Satan is not a name. It is a title. His name is not Satan. That's his title. What the Satan is, in Persian governments, the ruler was always afraid that somebody who was working for or with him would try to usurp his authority and knock him off of the throne. And so to prevent a bloody coup or to be sideswiped or blindsided, he would literally put somebody on payroll and stick them in the midst of those who worked for him. The job of that person on payroll was to come back and tell the ruler of the schemes that were being planned amongst the workers so that he would be prepared. That person was called the Satan. Satan desires to have you. In other words, the dynamics of this is in the courts of glory, in front of the judgment bar of God and his royal throne. Satan goes there and according to Revelation, he is the accuser of the brethren which is to suggest he is a tattletale. 
He is telling on you to God the Father, not just to upset God the Father, but to claim possession of your soul. In other words, this one has chosen me, and I can prove it because look at this list of things he's done. You're not feeling me. The devil goes in God's face and says, this one is mine. And I'm telling you, he's chosen me. I know he's chosen me and not you, God, because when I suggested that he ought to lie, he knew that you said that he ought to tell the truth, but he lied. And God, you were reading his mind, and you know what he was thinking when he saw that woman. Lord, you saw him when he filled out his income tax returns. He's chosen me. Now, God respects the power of choice. And you can select the devil if you want him. And God will not usurp the authority of the devil when you selected him. Therefore, what he was saying is, Peter, you're unconverted. The devil claims to be in control of your life. And the truth is, he's got a long list of evidence that suggests he's not lying. But when he gets you, he doesn't want to treat you good. He wants to sift you like wheat. Or do you want to talk about the sifting like wheat? The wheat grows in the field and first a sickle comes and chops it down. The devil wants to cut you down. But he doesn't want to cut you down until you get good and ripe. Which suggests that you're going to be at the highest point when he cuts you down. And after he cuts you down, he's going to take you and put you in a hard place. He's going to take something that looks like a baseball bat and he's going to beat on you so that the husk can come off and then the wind will blow. Oh, that's how wheat is processed. The devil wants to have you to beat you down. He wants to embarrass you. He wants to discourage you. Ultimately, he wants to destroy you. He wants to steal, kill, and he wants to destroy. And I can't help you if you keep on choosing him. Now, I told you that there's a complication in this thing. He's unconverted, which means he's not yet selected Jesus as the Lord of his life. He's allowed the devil to be in control, and that puts him in a posture or position that is somewhat hopeless. Why do I say that? Look at this. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And verses 3 through 4. Don't, don't let this get by. And by the way, elder, this has some significance for evangelistic approaches. Can I put it in a commercial? Will you allow me to, preacher? The worst way to do evangelism is to take what's in this book as dry facts and try to give people enough facts to be saved. The devil knows more facts than you'll ever know. And he's not going to be saved. Salvation is not an intellectual pursuit. That's not what it is. If it was, then smart people would have a distinct advantage to be saved. Folks like me would have to be at the back of the line and just hope. That's not how a person is saved. You can go to a lost soul and convince them of every truth that's in the Bible and they'll be just as lost when you finish. It's not just information. I use this illustration a lot. It's the illustration of a tub. If you take a tub, there is a little 30-cent gasket that goes around the drain valve. And if that gasket is not in place, you can close it up, fill it up with water, and when you turn around, it will be gone. There's nothing wrong with the water. The problem's with the tub. And until something happens to the heart, you're pouring truth into a person that can't do a thing with it. And you'll frustrate yourself to death, giving them more dry facts. What is needed is regeneration of the heart, not intellectual achievement. It's not a matter of learning the facts. It's a matter of being born again. Ah, if there was only a way I could make this clear. The dilemma. The complication. 
Peter's lost. The devil's in charge. He's unconverted. His life is up and down. Why is he in trouble? Why can't he just reach out to Jesus? Why doesn't he just get it? Here's why. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Remember, he's lost. That's what he is. How does a lost person get found? In whom the God of this world, that's the devil, has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Do you get this? We're frustrated that blind people can't see. When the problem is, they're blind. In other words, hey, why can't you see this thing I'm trying to show you? Have you ever tried to work with a drug addict and convince them that they have a problem? And you walk away frustrated that they don't come to the logical conclusion, not realizing the very nature of drugs is the mind is messed up so that it can't come to logical conclusions. You're going to destroy yourself. You're really not doing very well. When the nature of the drug addiction tells them that they're in charge and everything's going all right and you talk louder and louder and more and more logical and it doesn't register. How many lost people do you know who you've tried to convince of the Sabbath? The 2300 days. They ought not eat pork. Pork went in, we messed up. And we walk away frustrated, not knowing why don't they get it. That passage says that when they're under the control of the devil, he blinds them so that they cannot see. How then can they make it? If in fact I'm lost and I cannot see, I don't know the way. You're talking to me, but I still don't get it. And I can't get it because I'm under the control of the devil. God has his hands tied because I've made decisions to allow the devil to be the God of my life. You want me to be saved, but I'm not even sane enough to know what I need to ask for. You don't feel that complication? Well, you'll feel it at the point that a loved one who you desperately want to see come into the fold and be in the household of faith looks at you cross-eyed when you try to give them an Amazing Facts Bible study. Or when you sit that child down who you love dearly and try to explain to them the path they're on and they look at you as though you're speaking a foreign language. And your frustration comes from not realizing that they don't need more information. They need deliverance. There's a difference in giving me facts and helping me to be delivered. When I'm bound and want to be free but don't know how to be free, don't know what to ask for, and I'm lost, I think I'm in trouble. But I love the way this text develops. Simon, Simon. Here's your position. The devil desires to have you, Satan does, to sift you as wheat. You're not converted. But, but, you do know what but means. It means all of this stuff is bad news. You're messed up. There's a dilemma. You're in trouble. When the word but enters the picture, it suggests that there is a loophole. There is a way. The Calvary is coming on distant hill. It does not have to be the final word. That but is but a comma in the sentence, and the second half can be better than the first half. 
In other words, before you get to the period and before you close the coffin and before you put Peter in the ground, know that I prayed for you. But I pray. you couldn't pray for yourself because you didn't know you were lost. You didn't know what to ask for. But I prayed for you. I interceded for you. I stepped up for you. I asked for what you didn't know to ask for. My faith stood in place of your lack of faith. And God could move in my... Look at it. Look at it. Can we go to glory now? Can we go to glory? If it's going to be a black sermon, you have to have some homiletic license. I'm going to take my homiletic license and I'm going to drive into the throne room right now. And I'm going to look at what's transpiring up in the heavenly courts. The Father... God himself is sitting on his throne, reigning and ruling. When the devil walks into his throne room, I know he's done it before because I read it in the book of Job. He showed up and he was asked, why are you here? His answer was, I come from to and fro on the earth. In other words, people down there chose me to be their representative. That's why I'm here. Well, he's up there in the throne room again, causing problems. He's an annoyance. The spirit of prophecy says that he's such a, oh, what, what, what vegetarian word can I use? That when he got kicked out of glory and he requested to be allowed back in, he told one of the angels, go ask Jesus if I could come back in. I've changed my mind. And the word came back from a crying Savior. No, I can't let you back in. Your mind is not changed. You're no different. You just want to get back in here and keep messing stuff up. At that point, the devil couldn't get in, so he would hang out at the gates of the city taunting the angels. That's the kind of mentality we're dealing with. He's running up in the face of God now, and he's bringing the case of Peter. Peter who slept with the Lord, who laid down right beside him, who ate with him, who walked and talked with him, who received the best that Jesus had to offer. He's there now in the face of God saying, all that you did didn't work on Peter. Look at what I, I, I got on him. He was cussing. He was trying to call fire down from heaven on folks. He's no good. He's rotten. Every time I, I entice him, he falls in the midst of his discussion. Peter didn't pray, but the phone rang. Oh, somebody hear me? Hey, the phone rang. The phone, I believe there's a phone up there. And every now and then I call him up and I tell him what I need. I talk to him. Yeah, I don't travel to glory, but there is a phone. And the phone rang and the father said, hold on, Satan. Picked up the phone, said, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You got it. Hey, hey, let me, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Here, here, here's this. Here's this in, oh, man. This is in The Desire of Ages, page 667. Ellen White says this. She says that every sincere prayer is heard in heaven. Every sincere prayer is heard in heaven. You might have a stammering tongue, but when you pray a sincere prayer, Jesus himself stands before the Father and takes that prayer like it's his very own. He transposes it into the language of heaven so that there are no stammering, weak words used. And when the Father hears the request, it's just like it came from Jesus himself. Jesus interceded for Peter. And said, God, I know there's some good in Peter. Right now he's messing up. He's lost and the devil has him. But would you please honor my faith? I know that you can respond to your child. I'm your son. I've got faith for him. God, if you'll intercede and snatch him out of his pit. I believe if you can just remove him from darkness into light where he can see, he'll choose you. Now listen to what happens. The father can do for you because of the prayers of somebody else with faith. Oh, 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 no, 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 you don't feel me. I'm telling you that there's some times in life where you can be beaten down so heavily with an onslaught and assault from Satan himself. And you can try to keep a stiff back and a and a stiff upper lip and a smile on your face and going on God's errands. But the truth is your heart is broken. You're sapped of all of your strength. 
you don't know what to pray. You fall on your knees just because you're weak. And prayers can't even roll off of your tongue. All you can do is groan. I'm here to tell you that there's somebody who's praying for you. Hey, I'm not telling you what I don't know. I'm telling you what I've experienced. There have been some times in these last five or six years where I've had some trials and tribulations I could not share. I couldn't tell you about it, and I couldn't tell my mama about it. I couldn't tell my daddy, and I couldn't tell my president. I was walking in the valley of the shadow of death, and I could not pray for myself. But I thank God somebody prayed for me. Somebody prayed for me. Every now and then, every now and then, people would wander up to me and say, Pastor, I know what you're going through. I understood what they meant, but I knew they weren't accurate, nor were they right. They were simply trying to say, I relate to the fact that you're going through some pain. You can't understand it because I don't understand it. But what I know is that when somebody would walk up to me and say, Pastor, I've been praying for you. That word buoyed me up, set me straight, because I received in answer to their prayer what I could not pray for myself. Somebody pray for me. God has called us to the ministry of prayer. And it's hard time we stop praying for ourselves all the time. Somebody needs you to pray for them. If you don't think anybody prayed for you, you think you got here because you were so smart, you think you made it because you were so strong, think again, oh God, pull back the curtains so that they could see there was somebody on their knees praying for you. And when you were ready to give up, you couldn't because the faith of somebody else's prayer pulled you through. Peter, you're too dumb to know what to pray for. That's because you're unconverted and under the power of the devil. But I've prayed for you. And when thou art converted. In other words, my father hears my prayer. You're lost now, but you're not going to stay lost. It's not formality when I talk to my father. He hears me and he answers me. And if you'll cry out to Jesus today, he'll take your petitions to the father. And God will answer it like it's his petition. And not coming from a raunchy sinner like us. I think I want to end with Jesus tonight. Because there's something about that name. Well, ain't no need of me talking about my pains and my tribulations anymore. Oh, you probably want details, don't you? You're not getting them. All you need to know is I've been in that valley. And the only thing that's pulled me through is prayer. Every now and then I'll get a, a text message from my brother. Got one yesterday, and all it said was, Jimmy, praying for you. That's all I need to hear. That's all I need to hear. I can get up, put my suit on, and go on out like everything's all right. Because somebody prayed for me. Somebody prayed for me. Somebody prayed for me. Jesus stopped his dying long enough to pray for somebody. On Calvary, stretched out on that treat with the blood flowing not just in pain but humiliated as he was stripped naked in front of the world racked with pain from head to toe but he looked around Calvary's tree and when he saw lost sinners he said father forgive them that's prayer father forgive them Jesus, you mean you can stop your dying long enough to pray for me? When he said, Father, forgive them, guess what? I was one of the them. He prayed for me. He prayed for me. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. What needless pain we bear. Why? All because we don't carry everything to God in prayer. Let me be real. When you walk in the house of God, ready to get your praise on, don't be so into getting your blessing that you don't pray for that burdened down mother over there. Pray for them. 
press them to the throne. They're struggling with life. Pray for them. God can answer that prayer based on your faith. See, that's the answer. I don't know if you got it, but I'm blind because I'm lost. And I cannot see, so I don't know where to go. But when you pray for me, like Jesus prayed for Peter, light shines on his pathway. And once the light shines, Satan can say nothing because it's the answer to the prayer of faith. Oh, Satan will say he didn't ask for it. And the father will say, I know he didn't, but he did. And I have every right to answer his prayer. And once I'm in the light and I can see, Hey, they say that about people who are drug addicted. They say that if you can force them into therapy, in the midst of getting help, they'll get clear enough to know they needed help. And then and only then can their will kick in. They have no will when they're under the control of the addiction. They got to get a little light on the path first, and then they can make a decision about which way they'll go. That soul can't decide. He's in darkness, and he's blind. Get a little light on his path, and then he can make a decision about which direction he's going to go. Prayer changes things. More than that, prayer changes people. Forgive me, but if you had told me 10 years ago, I would go through some of what I've been through the last five, six years. I would not have bet a nickel I could survive it. You'll never get me to say I was strong enough. Those who know my secret situations sometimes say, how do you keep on going? There's only one way. Somebody prayed for me. I can't explain it. How you going to make it? Prayer. And wouldn't it be wonderful? I'm about to appeal now. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful to be part of a community of faith? Let me talk first to preachers. Preachers, can I talk to you? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we were part of a community of brothers who did not shoot our wounded? The kind of fellowship where I can enter and say, brothers, I'm broken. And it's not the basis on which I'm disqualified for service. But all it is is a call to prayer. Wouldn't that be beautiful? I believe the devil's knees would tremble if we got going on like that. Wouldn't it be wonderful if our churches were places where we developed and built people up and didn't discard the broken, disqualify the hurting? Where people could be assured that if I come in and expose my brokenness, I'm going to be in an environment of prayer where I'm lifted high and supported in my pain. I'm talking about the kind of authentic community where prayer rules. We don't talk about each other to each other. We only lift each other up to God. It's high time that prayer stops being the formal way that we open up meetings and close them. If it's the breath of the soul, why don't we start breathing? And I've learned that when I take my focus off of my pain long enough to lift somebody else up, my pain begins to subside. 
And the kind of God I serve is the kind of God that when he's passing out blessings, he doesn't pass me by. Everything I ask for you comes right back to me. I want to do something right now. Gail, I don't know, but can we sing something while they come down? This is what I want you to come down for. I want you, and I don't care right now, can you take your attention off of your own pain long enough to intercede for somebody else? Your pastor, family member, church member. I want you to come to this altar while this song is being sung, and you're coming to do what Jesus did for Peter. Peter was the powerful Pentecostal preacher. Cuss words rolling off his lips. But Jesus prayed for him. Powerful preacher. Prayer changes things. Push it a little bit closer. Push it a little bit closer. Everything to God in prayer. To God in prayer. Now I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to do something. Some may be comfortable enough to do it, others maybe not. That's up to you. I love annoying the devil. He's fooled with me enough. I want to fool with him right now. And I'm going to ask you if you would assist me. What he does not like is when God's children begin to pray. Right now, I don't want you to be pious and close your eyes and bow your head thinking about what you're going to do when you get home. I want you to pray, and I want the devil to hear it. I'm talking about some out loud prayer. The person next to you is not going to be listening to your prayer because they're praying too. I, I want in my mind's eye, I want to see the devil taking backward steps right now. I want him calling a meeting with his, his demons. I want to hear him say, uh-oh, they're not talking about prayer. Those rascals are praying. Oh, that's power now. Think about it. God will put it on your heart and your mind. Think about the person you want to pray for. You, you don't have to call their name out loud, but pray for them. Would you do that? See if you can get through one prayer without requesting anything for yourself. Let's intercede right now. Can we do it? On the count of three, let's start it. One, two, three.